to this new episode of Ask Stago, the podcast dedicated to provide expert answers to your expert questions in hemostasis. I am Audrey Carlo and I am really glad to be the co-host of this show with Cécile Ourquet. Today we will be back on the basics of the laboratory technique and answer the questions we received from UK and Brazil. What parameters are the most important to check when performing your calibration or how to validate your calibration like a pro? That question was more dedicated to the coagulation factor assessment, but this podcast will cover any type of calibration as the advice is will be good in any type of situation, actually. Cecile, can you please tell us more about our guests? Today, we are really glad to welcome back Draga Chipeva. Draga is an international application specialist in perform antenna training to our team. So, Draga, you are our expert for today. Hello. Hi, Cecile. Hi, Audrey. Thank you for having me back. Oh, it is so good to have you again with us today. Hello, Draga. Let's jump in our first question then. Of course, we need to start with the basics and talk about the first step, the reconstitution of reagent. Do you have any tips and tricks? Yeah, for sure. So accurate reconstitution of your controls, calibrators and reagents is for sure the first step to achieve a good calibration. There isn't much of a surprise there. It's important to follow closely the reagent preparation instructions from the product's package inserts and, of course, Running a calibration on freshly reconstituted products is better to avoid any issue due to incorrect storage or aging of the products. Yes, you're true there for sure. Fresh reagents will reduce the troubleshooting in case of any issue. Yes, and of course, with lyophilized products, the quality of the water and the calibration of the pipette is very important. So not to forget to check the auxiliary reagents, such as the orange color buffer used for the dilutions is very important. What can happen sometimes is the onboard stability of the orange color or the reconstituted reagents is not respected by the users by taking them off board, storing them in a fridge, then placing them back on board and adjusting the onboard stability. Easily mistakes can be made there. Uh, Daga, the person who sent us a question uh, from Brazil uh, was referring to the calibration of the factor essays. Uh, sometimes some labs are freezing the sample to run a batch of patient samples, for example, once or twice a week. Do you have tips and tricks for these uh, specific essays? Well, as factor level assessment is a specialized assay, The previous recommendations are, of course, key. A second advice is to run the calibration by pulling the reagent vials, especially if you have a large sample batch. It will have several benefits, such as reducing the onboard reagent vial positions and reducing, most importantly, the dead volume. But planning ahead, uh, you would avoid stopping the analysis because of a missing reagent or not obtaining all of your calibration points. Yes, having to deal with a high number of files is something quite common in the hemostasis bench, but pooling is sometimes useful. Now that our products are ready for pe- to perform the assay, I have an important question. Should we run the calibration on single mode or duplicate mode? Well, if a duplicate measurement is mandatory due to an extreme sensitivity of your products, for example, everything will be detailed on the product package insert. To directly answer your question, running the duplicates will statistically produce more robust calibration as it provides you an extra control point. I strongly recommend it for the factor assays, as this was the main origin of your question you got. And especially when the calibration performed intends to last for the whole reagent batch shelf life in your laboratory. I remember some customers that also um, were used to run the maintenance and do after the calibration. What is your recommendation about it? Well, actually, um, I have already seen some customers running some special coag tests after the weekly maintenance. Uh, I suppose it was to run the samples in an instrument as clean as possible, but it's really not mandatory or even proven to be more efficient. What you need to do is to respect the maintenance schedule of your instrument in general by following the manufacturer's recommendations. So now we are ready. Um, We come to the final part of this podcast, how to validate the calibration results. 
So the first and the easiest thing perhaps to do is to check the correlation coefficient, also known as the R value. Depending on the test methodology, the lower limit of the R value varies. In most cases, the correlation coefficient must be at least 0.995, but for example, it can be set to 0.997 or 0.998 for some assays, depending on what the manufacturer has validated. Secondly, you can check the aspect of the curve, especially when it's linear. A curve should pass close to all measurement points. As you said, like the regression coefficient is here to give you the idea of about is your line is passing through all the points. What is a good power? So it is for sure something which is really helpful when you have several vials, for example, one vial per a point of calibration, because if one has a problem of a constitution, you will see right away which, that it is outside um, the the linear uh, perspective. But is it the same if we are using the same bottle? I suppose that at this moment, it's clear that using duplicate sponge is useful, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. A good tip is not to have more than 10% difference between each duplicate point. But again, for some assay methodology, the relative difference limit between the duplicate is maybe lower. It's important to note that you can always restart one calibration point or suppress one of the duplicate measurements if you do not meet the criteria of one of the calibration concentration. And especially if the calibration is intended to be set for the whole reagent batch shelf life. I strongly advise to restart the whole calibration if you do not meet these criteria. And the last point is to check that there is no more than 10% difference between the calibrator expected value and the interpolation, i.e. the result when you have your curve. I would maybe also had a more basic trick, but I, I was always recommended it to customer to keep few calibrations somewhere, either printed or stored in the system. If you have a doubt, it is also great to have some good example of the previous curves to see the general aspect of the curve, of course, its slope and intercept, but also the expected row values for each calibrators. And of course, you can have this type of information in your system software or your data manager. I have two last questions for you, Daria. First, what should I check for pre-calibrated assays? Well, for any calibration, you should perform your quality controls after running or importing the calibration curve. It's the final validation of your calibration. For the pre-calibrated assays, the goal is not to have very much to do. Depending on the technique, you will only have to change the 100 point, also known as the reference time, like for the PT test. And then the key thing is to run the QC. Yeah, and of course, please refer to the previous podcast of the season one about the determination of the MNPT if you want to learn all the tips and tricks about it. Thank you, Cecil. And Raga, if you have a last message for our listeners, uh, what would it be? So my key takeaway messages would be to obtain a good calibration curve is to make sure that your reagents are properly reconstituted. That's point number one. The orange color buffer is freshly loaded on board. The user maintenance is performed on a regular basis according to the manufacturer's instructions. You have sufficient reagent volumes present on board on your analyzer at the start of your assay. And what is important to bear in mind if you're using heterogeneous systems and references, that this can lead to heterogeneous results, even if the same assay methodology is used. So it's important to always, at the end of your calibration curve, to check the key points and to manually validate it. Thank you, Draga, for this conclusion. Well, it is now time to close this episode. Thank you all for listening. And please feel free to send us any question that you may have at our email address, askastago.com, and we'll be glad to answer it in the next episode. See you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.